Welcome back. Uh, so we're having a look still at switching and forwarding. And so in this case, uh, virtual circuit switching. So this is used instead of routing each packet uh, or each frame separately uh, in its, uh, you know, on its own, really, without reference to any others. Um, here we're using the idea of a, a virtual circuit. So this is a connection-oriented model. So we mean effectively that uh, we look at the stream of packets or frames going from one host to another for a particular purpose. Uh, so we set that virtual connection up first, uh, and then we can use that uh, for you know uh, for all of the the communication that's happening as part of that stream. Uh, so this can be more efficient for routers, and again, probably found more use uh, you know going back 10, 20 years ago when uh, the routers and switches didn't have the capacity to do real time switching uh, for uh, very large numbers of uh, of distinct frames and packets coming through. Uh, the other thing that it's quite handy for is for establishing a quality of service on a particular link because the virtual circuit might dedicate, for example, say 10% of a link um, to a particular circuit. Uh, and so this can be quite good for video conferencing or telephony is the other kind of main use that it uh, historically has found. So again, we might have host A wants to establish a circuit uh, to host B to send packets. And again, we have a bunch of switches uh, along the way. Um, whoops. And uh, in setting up the circuit, uh, there'll be essentially a negotiation that will go through. So this switch up here has no role to play, so that won't be involved uh, in the circuit. Um, but the arrangement, so host A will go, okay, I'm sending into switch one. Switch one knows if those frames are coming in from host A on port two. Um, they need to go out on port one. Switch two gets them in on port three and goes, okay, it's come in on port three. It needs to go out on port two. Um, into switch three on port zero, and it knows that host B is out on port one. Uh, and of course, there will be uh, some kind of marking in the um, the packets or frames to say that they're for a particular flow, for a particular virtual circuit. Uh, so on Ethernet, that could be VLAN tagging, for example, uh, or one of a, a number of other approaches. And then we have that dedicated path and resource uh, through the network. So um, again, there are two stages to that. The first is actually establishing the connection, so setting it up uh, and working out the path and uh, how it's going to go. Um, and each of the switches needs to be involved in that connection setup so that it knows what its role is uh, in there. And only after that, uh, and after the switch has recorded the information, so in uh, a virtual circuit table or an equivalent uh, data structure, can the data transfer actually uh, begin. So the virtual circuit identifier um, uniquely identifies that connection uh, to the switch so that it knows uh, where that needs to go, uh, where the, the packets need to, um, uh, to be forwarded onto. Uh, so again, this could be a, a tag uh, that's uh, prefixed by the, uh, the first host onto the, um, uh, the, the packets or frames, or it could be that the switch actually looks in it and goes, okay, it's this particular port information, and it just remembers. It doesn't have to make an active decision. Um, and it and will tell the switch which uh, outgoing interface that it needs to connect to. Um, and what the destination, the next hop destination will be uh, on that port. And it depends on the, the switches as to how they implement this. So it could be that you have one virtual circuit identifier for the entire path, or it could be that at each, uh, between each pair of switches involved in the path that you have a separate uh, virtual circuit identifier. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, every packet coming in on the designated incoming interface and that has the correct virtual circuit identifier uh, in its header, then that packet will be sent out by the rule uh, for that virtual circuit identifier. So it's a, a very uh, efficient process for the switch to implement because it only needs to look at that uh, information. And so it's the VCI is what is enabling the uh, each connection or um, virtual circuit uh, to be established, and so different VCIs uh, will correspond to different connections. Uh, and you can have, typically, uh, switches will support having many uh, virtual circuit uh, virtual circuits active at any point in time, and thus virtual circuit identifiers uh, in the table. Uh, what's important is that the, again, generally speaking, the VCIs are specific to the switch on which it's created. So where you have multiple switches, they may have different VCIs for the same uh, connection uh, overall for their their part of it, and they're not globally unique. They're not globally addressable uh, in that particular way. 
Um, but some networks may work to try and avoid having the same VCI occurring on multiple links around the network just to avoid the potential for confusion if a, a packet ends up uh, going in the, uh, the wrong direction. And so virtual circuits can be handled in a couple of different ways. They can either uh, be a permanent virtual circuit, so the network administrator will configure and set that up and uh, put it through uh, in the different switches. Uh, and that tends to be a long-lived uh, setup. And you set this up where you want, indeed, a, a long-lived uh, network path for some purpose. So this might be, for example, uh, a VLAN uh, tunnel through some area of the network to connect two particular work sites together. You could do that way. Um, alternatively, um, you can have a switched virtual circuit uh, where the, uh, the host sends messages into the network to cause the virtual circuit to be established. Uh, and these will tend to be much more short-lived and they're under the control of the, uh, you know, the, the programs running on the network rather than under the control of the network administrator. So again, if we have a, a look uh, uh, at an example, so the network administrator wants to set up a, a path from host A to host B. This needs to go through several switches and network administrator needs to identify those, uh, that path themselves uh, and then uh, set that up. So if we, again, if we have a look, so the incoming interface is number two on switch one. So it's number two, um, and it might give the virtual circuit identifier number five, and it will need to go out on interface one. Again, we have a look back here, out on interface one uh, to the next switch, and the outgoing VCI will have a different number uh, so that the next switch uh, can see that VCI. Uh, and so indeed, uh, on the, the next switches. So it'll be incoming interface three. Again, if we come back and have a look, so it's coming on three, it'll go out on two. In on three, out on two, the incoming VCI matches the outgoing from the previous hop. And then it will create a new outgoing virtual circuit identifier, which will be the incoming virtual circuit identifier uh, on the next switch. And again, we see for that last switch, it comes in on zero, goes out on one. Uh, and indeed we see comes in on zero, out on one, and the outgoing virtual circuit identifier, again, uh, uh, is set differently to the incoming virtual circuit identifier. Uh, so now, for any uh, packet that wants to uh, be sent from A to B on this network, uh, we have the, you know, this tagging of the, um, uh, uh, of the, the packets or frames with a virtual circuit identifier. So it puts, in the first case, it puts five in, because that was, again, if we come back, that's the required incoming virtual circuit uh, on there. Switch one, when it forwards it on, will take the five out and put 11 in, because that's what needs to be in for uh, switch two to correctly handle uh, that packet. And again, this will happen throughout the network until it eventually gets uh, delivered to its destination. So again, we see at the next step, it's come in as 11 goes out as seven on switch two. Uh, and eventually then it will go out uh, on port one. Host B is not a switch, uh, and switch three realizes that, so it actually doesn't need to, to tag uh, that virtual circuit necessarily, but it will depend on the network type as to whether that uh, is actually done or not. And so that gets us uh, through uh, to end to end. But of course, if you're having to set these things up across a large network for a whole bunch of uh, purposes, um, then this can be quite cumbersome, having to log into all of the switches and change the configurations, remember the password for the switch and all of those sorts of things. Um, so often even in the case of uh, permanent virtual circuits, uh, now people will use network tools and effectively they will be um, SVCs, even if they're actually set up for, for long-term use uh, because of the, the network automation tools that are available. Okay, oh, and that's inexplicably small font. Um, so the signaling, if we want to set up a, um, a virtual circuit, uh, an SVC, uh, then the sending host needs to send some kind of message uh, that tells the, the network fabric, uh, and in the first case, switch one, where it wants to get to, so that um, node B, it might need to say things about how much uh, bandwidth it requires uh, and other relevant information, uh, quality of service information, for example. Uh, and then that switch will receive it and it will think about, okay, now what's the best path for me to get to host B? And it will send it on to that next step. So switch two. And so progressively, 
uh, this will get added into the, um, uh, the virtual circuit table for each of the switches. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that will go all the way through uh, until that's been established. And now that it's all been uh, set up, uh, there needs to be confirmation uh, sent back through the network so that um, host A knows that this has been done and each of the other switches knows what the virtual circuit identifiers are uh, so that the complete path uh, can be set up or can be made available to use. Uh, and when it uh, no longer needs it, it will kind of do a, a, uh, the reverse. It will tell switch one, I don't need this virtual circuit anymore. Switch one will tell uh, the other switches in the path progressively and they will tear down the VCIs. Uh, and then at the end, uh, the virtual circuit no longer exists. So one of the, uh, the issues with this is that you actually have to kind of uh, you know, this propagation through the network to establish it takes a little bit of time. So you've got at least one round trip of delay before the first packet can be sent of data. Whereas without a virtual circuit, you can just insert a, a packet uh, and it will start getting routed immediately uh, through. Um, and also while the, uh, the packets will contain the network address uh, for B, uh, that it's actually, uh, you know, that's not how the, the data is being uh, relayed. Um, it's via typically this much smaller identifier, which is the virtual circuit link over a single link. Uh, and so if you took out, and again, if the virtual circuit allows this to remove the, uh, the globally addressable network address, so if we think about an IPv4 address, that's four bytes, IPv6 uh, is 16 bytes. Uh, and so if the packet size is small relative to those, uh, then this can provide considerable uh, efficiency uh, and so things like frame relay uh, that have very small frame sizes rely on this to get any kind of uh, efficiency now one of the, the issues is that because we're setting up a static path through the network for this virtual circuit um, if any of the switches fails or something you know they get rebooted or otherwise that might uh, disturb that then you actually have to uh, create uh, a new virtual circuit uh, again because the connection will be interrupted whereas with uh, datagram based switching uh, the uh, you know the network will identify alternate paths uh, in real time uh, and send it through. Uh, of course, when we start talking about routing algorithms, again, the virtual circuit process actually effectively uh, is implementing a routing algorithm. It's just whether you do it once for the whole connection or for every packet, and that's in a sense the fundamental difference, a fundamental difference between virtual circuits and datagram switching. Uh, and so. If we think about advantages of virtual circuits, once the host starts being able to send, um, the, the network topology that matters has already been discovered and the route has been locked in. Uh, and uh, we can also do the quality of service so we can allocate resources to make sure that it will be reliable. So with a phone call, you avoid kind of the audio dropouts and things that you tend to get with um, uh, cheap voice over IP setups. Um, you know, like with a cellular modem, a cellular phone on 4G, it's actually, doing a virtual circuit over IP, but it's just as good as the old uh, dedicated virtual circuit setup uh, that wasn't IP based uh, on the earlier generations of phones because the virtual circuit guarantees uh, the bandwidth availability and the jitter uh, limitations. And we'll stop there because this is already getting a little bit long and continue that in the next video.